song. Uh, in case you're wondering, it doesn't teach pantheism or panentheism that God's in everything and everyone, as if we're all a composite part of who God is, but rather it teaches Isaiah 42, verse 5, that tells us that our very breath is a gift from God. He's the one who has given us life. Obviously, the Genesis account talks about that as well, and many other passages in the Psalms, that God is the one who gives us the very breath that we have, and so we can praise and worship Him. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this chipper morning here in Minnesota. Uh, we're in the land of blessing right here. I talked to my parents up north. It's 23 below and 36 below windchill. And anybody just a little ways south of here got a foot of snow. So we're in the land of blessing, right? <laughs> Be encouraged. I want to uh, encourage you to uh, come on out tonight. Once every quarter, we have a prayer meeting. We have weekly prayer meetings as well. But this quarterly prayer meeting entitled Encounter tonight, our time of worship. And then after the time of worship, a time of prayer. We're going to be praying very specifically for our church plant that's coming up very quick. And you'll see also a preview service in your bulletins on January 27th. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that. But that's coming quick, and that'll be the prayer focus for us uh, tonight as well. Uh, we want to have you turn your attention to the screen, and even though we're stepping out of James, let's say our memory verse together, starting verses, starting with the reference and ending with the references, reference as well. James 1, 2 to 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2-4. Father, as we step out of James and into this topic on this Sunday, designated across our nation in many churches celebrated the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, I pray that you'd speak to us truth and grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been pastoring almost 30 years, and every Mother's Day, and when I have focused the pulpit time on the sanctity of human life Sunday, I personally know people who choose not to come to church if that is the focus of the message in particular because of their life experiences. I want to assure you in this message this morning, a heart for those who have not been able to have children, a heart for those who have had miscarriages, a heart for those who have lost children earlier in life or at any stage in life, as well as God's love and forgiveness when we come to Him with repentant hearts for those who have aborted pregnancies and been party to that choice. With this as our foundation and starting point this morning, we do want to lovingly and truthfully address a very important topic, the topic of human life at all stages, but here this morning and on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, especially life in the womb as it began at conception. This is not a political message, but it's a biblical message for us as people who want to align our worldview, our thinking, with what the Scriptures say. In 1973, uh, abortion was legalized in America in the Roe v. Wade decision, and you can read the statistics and all of the information about what's transpired since then. Also know that abortion has been something that's happened in every culture in human history. Uh, examples of it going way, way back. It's a part of the brokenness of our culture, of our hearts, of humanity. And so we recognize that reality. I also want to say here in the introduction that what you're hearing today is totally and radically countercultural in our society in America today, in Europe, and in many other parts of the world. Not all parts of the world. But it is totally and radically countercultural. We live in a culture where people in mass, by far the majority, have simply accepted the fact that terminating a pregnancy is a person's personal choice. Period. That's the world and the culture that we live in today. I want to help us out again like I did last May by turning us back to the very first book of the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 1, verses 26 and 7. And while you're turning there, I want to uh, read these two verses. 
Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, a reference to the Trinity, the Holy Spirit's mentioned earlier. Colossians tells us Jesus was an agent of creation as well. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man, mankind, humanity, in our image. A very important phrase. After our likeness. And let them have, human beings, dominion, stewardship over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then notice this. So God created earlier in this chapter. And God said, and God said, and God said ten times. And when God speaks, creation comes into existence. So God said again, let's make people. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. Three times created. In the image of God, two times in his own image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God is the one who created and creates human life. He is the source of life. Just very briefly and high level, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Uh, do we not see God's design and the wonder and beauty of flowers and plants and animals? We're absolutely amazed when animals do incredible tricks and, and seem to be able to communicate at some level with human beings. I've always questioned that with our dogs, but that's a different topic. But uh, you look at them and you can interact and maybe they can catch a few things. But try to take on a rational, intellectual, verbal conversation with any animal and see if they're able to reciprocate with you in a rational, verbal, meaningful, interactive communication kind of way. And thus the difference, even between the greatest of monkeys and us as human beings. We've been created in God's image. What does it mean to be human? That's the big issue. When does life begin and how do we define life? If you're looking at your sermon notes, You'll see I've invited a couple of brothers in particular. We could have ladies up here doing the same thing. Perhaps next year if we address the same topic, we'll do that. But in particular, some unique ways in which God brought these pieces together for me. I preached on this subject last May, uh, and uh, I've decided to invite a couple of uh, your fellow parishioners to join us this morning on the platform for seven, eight, ten minutes each. The first is Joe Pine. Joe and his wife Julie have been a part of First Free here for a long time. Uh, Joe teaches in one of our many congregations periodically. He's an author. Uh, he writes uh, some of his most recent books on experience-based economy, and he speaks literally all over the world, as well as the United States, and uh, is now recently, on his own time as well, now authoring a book and working on a book on apologetics. I'm not sure that this topic is involved in there, but as an intellectual, I say this very lovingly and respectingly, respectively uh, to Joe. Uh, I think he can speak into our hearts and minds a little bit this morning. So I invite Joe to come, an apologist's processing of the beginning of life, a fellow brother in Christ. So Joe, come on up and uh, share. Microphone number one, it's on, you're good to go. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor. of this topic, what makes us human. And uh, many of you know that uh, my father died last month. In fact, today is the one month anniversary. He went in the hospital with pneumonia on uh, Thursday, December 13th, and despite being in very good physical health up to that point, he just could not get enough oxygen into his blood. By Sunday evening, the doctors had to intubate him, putting a tube into his mouth to deliver oxygen straight to the lungs. There was still some hope of recovery at that point, but by Wednesday, that hope was gone. We decided to remove the breathing tube. I was able to be with him at the end when shortly after midnight, his numbers started to worsen. His heart rate went down with his blood pressure and his breathing rate as well. I soon realized that this would be the end, so for 20 minutes, I held his hand. I talked to him about our life together. I uh, prayed for him until at 12.21 a.m. on Thursday, December 20th, his heartbeat got slower and slower and finally stopped. Now, I tell you this story not to be macabre or to gain your sympathy, but to make this one point. We all know that someone dies when their heart stops beating. So how do we know when someone is alive? Right? When their heart is beating. 
The heart is, in fact, the very first organ in a fetus to develop, even before skins or bones, as the flow of oxygenated blood is needed by all the other organs. The rudimentary heart, called a heart tube that is not yet fully formed, nor flowing with blood, but it begins beating just over three weeks after conception. And by six weeks, the heart is fully beating and supplying blood to the fetal body. And you can hear it on an ultrasound and at just six weeks. But does the fetus have life? Some say that to truly be alive, a person must have brain activity. Otherwise, they're just a physical shell with nothing going on inside. People call it being a vegetable. So when does the brain of a fetus start having brain activities? Well, portions of the brain appear and separate into left and right hemispheres at just four and a half weeks. And a fetus begins emitting brain waves that can be detected at just over six weeks. And now you've all heard the term brain dead, right, when there are no waves. Well, at just six weeks, a baby not only has a beating heart, but it's brain alive. But, what does, but does that fetus actually have life? There are at least 79 human organs, five of them we call vital organs, essential to ongoing human life, the heart and the brain, of course, but also the lungs, the, the liver, and the kidneys. Well, by five weeks, the embryonic liver produces blood cells for the first time to supply the heart. Fetal kidneys also appear by five weeks, and lung buds appear at four weeks and begin dividing into ref, left and right uh, lobes. I'll also mention that by six to eight weeks, the fetus begins to move and respond to its environment and sometimes even gets hiccups. But some say even if it has a beating heart and even if it has brain activity and all the other vital organs at six or so weeks and is alive in some sense, it's still not a human being until it's born. Well, then what is it? A plant? An animal? An extraterrestrial, perhaps? I mean, scientists denote what kind of entity a living being is by identifying its species. Our species, the human species, is named Homo sapiens, which means wise man. You know, whoever named it didn't know his fellow human beings very well. <laughs> but there are many ways scientists use to determine what species something is. In particular, they examine it externally and or internally. And any examination of a fetus would show that it looks like a human being inside and out from about seven to eight weeks. Or they can look at its DNA. What would the DNA of any fetus show? That it is a human being, a member of the species Homo sapiens. When would the fetus show that? From the moment of conception. For what conception does is bring the DNA of a mother together with the DNA of a father, mix them together, and poof, you have a new human being. And some say a fetus is not fully human, however because it's so very dependent on the mother, something called a parasite. Well, a parasite is, by definition, from a different species of the host, and we know that's not true with any pregnancy. And it is true that a fetus is not yet viable, capable of living outside the womb until around 24 weeks, when its lungs can finally breathe air. So you could also liken it to being on life support, like how my dad had a breathing tube inserted into him to provide oxygen to his lungs during the last three days of his life, with very quickly, you know, little hope of recovery. But with a fetus, there is no recovery necessary, for the innate drive inherent within the DNA of the fetus is to produce a fully functional human being. And at birth, at which point almost no one disputes that the baby now is a full human being, although there are, in fact, a few, the baby still requires life support, nourishment, shelter, protection, and, of course, love, something that every human being requires. Before, well, and in fact, you could actually say it requires more life support after birth than it does before. Before, it's all passive. The, the mother just has to avoid bad things that could happen to her fetus and let nature take its course. After birth, it's much more active. If the mother or father or someone else does not actively care for the baby, it will die. No one can therefore say that requiring life support detracts from the humanness of any fetus. Now, let me tell you a little story about our daughter, Becca. You know, Becca, for some reason, I actually really have no idea, she always complained about the fact that her mother and I fell in love together and got married so quickly. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was uh, we had one date in August of 1984, the end of the month. We had a few dates in September, uh, you know, a few more in October, down to about once every week, and November even more. And then by December of that year, we're basically seeing each other every day. 
And on January 22nd, 1985, I asked her to marry me, and we got married on uh, September 7th of that year. So just like one week over uh, a year from the very first time uh, we, um, uh, we dated. And Becca always thought, that's, that's just way too soon. That's not how it's supposed to happen. You know, first you date a lot, and then you have the talk. I'm still not sure what the talk, what all is in there, but you have the talk. And then you date some more, and then you get engaged, and then you go on and plan the wedding and date some more until you finally have, uh, have the wedding. Uh, and the amazing thing is that when Becca finally fell in love with her husband, Ryan, she did it more quickly than we did. <laughs> <laughs> she fell in love more quickly, she got engaged more quickly, and she got married 11 months after her first date, right? Not even a year. But for some reason, this always bothered her that we did it so, uh, so quickly. And, and whenever that happened, you know, here's what I tell her, is that, is that if it didn't happen exactly the way it did, she wouldn't be here. Right? She wouldn't be here to complain. If it happened differently, <laughs> and Julie and I got married later, started a family later, had a daughter, even named her Rebecca, she still would not be the Becca that we had and love today. That Rebecca would be a different person. Personhood is set by this particular egg of all the monthly cycles of eggs being fertilized by this particular sperm among all the tens of millions of sperm that are uh, fighting to be able to fertilize that egg that month. So the human being, the person that any fetus will become, is in fact set at conception. And again, within six or weeks, Six or seven weeks after conception, that human person has a beating heart pumping blood into its body with a brain with working activity, his brain alive, not to mention having lungs, kidneys, and a liver. So don't let anyone tell you that a fetus is not a living human being. It's a baby. Thanks, Joe. Great job. Great job. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139, like we did last May, to these foundational passages in Genesis and in the Psalms. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, say the same thing that Joe just said. For you, in, you form my inward parts. You knitted me together where in my mother's womb. Who did that? God did. David's talking about how God worked in his mother's womb to create uniquely David as a human being. And David says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very, very well. God created us in the womb. I was reading an article last night. It's a weekly Desiring God article that comes out, and oftentimes it's connected to uh, the topic, if there is a nationwide topic or something like Sanctity of Human Life. And the article last night was, and this blogger wrote a number of different things, more than I can get into, but one of the things he said, it's so important, young people especially, old people alike, that we get equipped with an essential pro-life argument and convey it even to non-Christians. Yes, we believe what the Bible says. We believe that God's the one who formed us. We sang about He's the one who gave us life. He's the one who created life in the womb. But the basic argument that was referenced just freshly last night in this brand new blog was this, premise number one, it is wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. I would guess every single person that you meet, almost everyone, would agree with that. Premise number two, abortion intentionally kills innocent human beings who have no choice. Therefore, conclusion, abortion is morally wrong. Much more could be said. Perhaps you'd even reference the article. You can get it easily. But note God's Word. God's the one who made us fearfully and wonderfully where He knit us together in our mother's womb. This morning, uh, Dr. Tom Greenlee is with us. Tom and his wife Adele have been at First Free for years. Now they've served in the uh, library. Uh, they've been on short-term mission trips going on one this summer. Uh, his wife is a professor at Bethel University, is retired now. Tom is still teaching. He's a Ph.D. physics professor there. And uh, he shared with me one time uh, recently that for a number of years, he has been a sidewalk counselor in front of abortion clinics. And I said, I would like to hear about that. And I think you would as well. So, Tom, if you would come and share during these next few minutes, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Well, hi. 
Uh, uh, Pastor Todd asked me to talk about my pro-life volunteer work, so I'll do that. But I hope I can also describe the many possibilities for other types of volunteer work in the pro-life movement and the importance of those activities also. My activity is called Sidewalk Counseling. The uh, organization that coordinates it in this area is Pro-Life Action Ministries. And our goal, our goals are to save babies' lives and to help the parents, help the mothers and fathers that are uh, heading toward the clinic uh, in uh, intending abortion. And how? Well, we offer help. We offer help. We offer options. We let them know that there are realistic choices besides abortion. And there are lots of people and organizations ready to help with finances and with medical help, with housing, with adoption, if they choose that option. We also let them know about the risks, the physical, emotional, spiritual risks of abortion. And about then, and we let them know uh, that the life inside the mother is a baby, is a son or a daughter. And we also let them know what abortion does to a baby. Now you may think, after 46 years of legalized abortion, that everyone, <laughs> everyone knows these things, right? Um, actually, many don't. Uh, many women reluctantly head for abortion clinics because they don't know about other options. They don't know where else to turn for help. And many feel pressured by uh, parents or boyfriends or husbands. Many uh, pro-choice people really don't know what abortion does. I'm, I'm reading a book uh, now uh, uh, titled Gosnell, about Kermit Gosnell, who is a Philadelphia abortionist. Um, and uh, it mentions a couple of uh, uh, assistant district attorneys, uh, sharp, intelligent, experienced women who were absolutely shocked at the sight of the uh, uh, fetal remains in Gosnell's clinic. So a lot of people don't really know. Um, we also offer help to women who have had abortions. We, we care about the baby. We care about the mother. We care about the mother after she's had the abortion. And we try to offer uh, help. There's um, a pamphlet we offer, God's Amazing Grace, that uh, details, well, that gives advice on how to cope with the aftermath of abortion and also lists organizations that can help. Um, we try to have counselors outside the clinics, not just when people are going in, but when abortion uh, patients are coming out. And so we offer the information about resources. Uh, so what's it like to be a sidewalk counselor? Well, um, it, a typical shift is two hours a week. Doesn't have to be. You don't have to spend uh, that. But but a typical shift is two hours a week. The coordinator, since since my schedule kind of varies from semester to semester, I uh, get in touch with the coordinator. The coordinator. Uh, tries to pick from the times I'm available to match the greatest need. And I go to the clinic and stand there, walk back and forth, offer information to people who look like they might be coming in for an abortion. And I offer, um, most of the time, most of the time, offer these two pamphlets. There's a, we're here for you, uh, that tells women they're not alone, there's help available, and also uh, this pamphlet on free help for pregnant women. It lists just a ton of organizations that can provide help. We uh, want to offer help. Uh, 
as I say, with, with finances, with uh, medical help, housing. And uh, so I offer those pamphlets. Now, some people take the information, and uh, some people don't, uh, and just keep on uh, going. We try to be on duty uh, week after week in all kinds of weather. Uh, the head of pro-life action ministries has a saying, it's not too cold, you just haven't dressed warm enough. Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, any one individual counselor can go a long time without visible results. Um, and uh, by a visible result, by what we call a visible save, we mean that a, a person, a woman, maybe a couple, were coming in for the abortion. They either took the literature or, or interacted with us. And as far as we can tell, because of that interaction, they chose not to have the abortion, chose to give their baby life. Uh, so that's what we call a save. Uh, you can go a long time, uh, years, without on your shift, seeing a, a save, a visible save. Um, I hope, I hope that uh, people who took the information uh, pass it along to family members, maybe people they know who are struggling with crisis pregnancies. We sometimes hand out the information to passers-by in the hopes that uh, they'll also give it to people who are, they know who are struggling with crisis pregnancies. I should say, when I'm on duty, it's time for prayer. I, it, it's an intense time of prayer. I need prayer for, uh, to overcome my own weaknesses, uh, prayer for grace in the eyes of people going into the clinics, and, of course, prayer for God to work in their hearts. But collectively, collectively, uh, we do praise God for the results. Almost every week, I get emails from Pro-Life Action Ministries about uh, babies that have been saved. Um, there, uh, in, in 2017, for instance, as far as we know, uh, as far as we can document, uh, there were 83 babies saved. Since March of 1981, when Pro-Life Action Ministries started, uh, it's sidewalk counseling ministry. There have been over 3,300 babies saved. And um, sometimes we learn about saves that we didn't know about. Uh, one woman driving past an abortion clinic uh, told the sidewalk counselors there that years before she was headed to the clinic and saw the sidewalk counselors there and decided not to abort her baby. Now, of course, you can imagine in a situation like this and in the charged atmosphere in our country, we do get comments from uh, passers-by uh, and from people going into the clinics. Um, on one extreme, uh, there used to be, used to be, uh, we're grateful, not anymore, uh, an abortion clinic that was right beside the headquarters of Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge in Minneapolis, and so I got a lot of good affirmation from the Christians going into that, uh, into that headquarters. And, and a lot of the times uh, there are pro-life um, workers in other medical facilities that are in the same uh, building as an abortion clinic and get a firm affirmation from there. But, of course, get uh, the negative comments, too. Um, once in a while, a hand gesture or something like that. Uh, at, at the other extreme, there, there was an angry young man who uh, would walk by every once in a while, try to uh, actually try to knock the pamphlets right out of my partner's hands, um, uh, flip our signs over, uh, spit out some vulgarities at us. So there are those things, too. Uh, one thing that's increased my motivation lately is to try to visualize the situation from the point of a mother coming to the, towards the clinic. Now, we know, that, we know that God can speak directly to people's hearts. 
we know that. But uh, often he does use means. He uses visible human means often to do, to do that. And in terms of the human visible means, we may be the baby's last line of defense before the abortion room. Um, now, we sidewalk counselors, though, depend on many other pro-life workers. There are prayer supporters who come out uh, and simply stand uh, in front of the clinic and pray. And uh, people have actually been turned away from the, uh, have turned away from the clinic when they've seen people praying in front of it. Um, we uh, depend on the organizations that we list to help the women, and we're really grateful for the staff and the volunteers of those organizations like uh, New Life Family Services. Um, the work that Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life does on the legislative and regulatory end is, is vital. And we need organizations like Alliance Defending Freedom who actually go to court to protect our rights to be on the sidewalk in, outside the clinics. There have been cases, there was one case that went to the Supreme Court um, about uh, sidewalk counseling and uh, a, a state-mandated uh, no-counseling zone within many yards of, of the uh, entrance. Um, and so we're uh, grateful for that. And of course, our fundamental dependence is on God. God alone can change people's hearts. God alone can establish the work of our hands, and without his work, all our efforts are uh, chaff in the wind. But we do thank and praise him. We see him at work, and so all glory to him. Great job. All right, back to Psalm 139, and then we'll turn to the New Testament in our remaining few minutes. The rest of Psalm 39, this section that's familiar, verses 15 and 16 says this, My frame, this is David again reflecting on his life, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, Hebrew a poetic term for being formed in his mother's womb. And catch this, your eyes saw my unformed substance. If God sees a human being, and he created a human being, he knows and he loves and cares for those human beings. So what happens to miscarriage babies, to aborted babies? Psalm 139 talks about the fact that we're created by God in the womb. It also talks about the fact that He cares for us in the womb. And thus I close by turning our attention to a familiar story in the New Testament in Mark 10, verse 13. They were bringing children to Jesus that He might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them, thought He was too busy, don't bother Him with children. But Jesus saw it. He was indignant. He was moved emotionally. He was not happy about this. And so he said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. Catch this phrase. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. We read that story and we create wonderful drawings or pictures of Jesus with kids on, a, on, a, on his lap. And we love that picture and I do very much so as well. And that's very important to see that picture. And then we jump to the other part of the passage and we say, oh, that's a spiritual principle. We need to come like little children when we come to God, trusting in, in faith in him. And that's absolutely true. But don't miss the middle phrase. For to such becomes or belongs... The kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Eternal life. Jesus, according to Mark 10 and the parallel passages, cares for little children. It's not just the text for pictures of Jesus with little kids around Him. There are truths here. He wants children to come to Him. 
The kingdom can be personally theirs when they're old enough and they can come in faith trusting in Jesus Christ. We must come in the same way. But what if they're too young to understand? What if they pass away in a miscarriage? Or as we've talked about here this morning, what happens to children in those cases? Many years ago when Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma Federal Building, there was a nursery that was destroyed and many, many children lost their lives. And Billy Graham said when they, as children, lost their lives, they were instantly in the presence of the Lord. Uh, John MacArthur has a book that is a wonderful book entitled Safe in the Arms of God. And no one Bible teacher or scholar can be right on everything, but it's a compelling read. I've read sections of it, not all of it. Safe in the arms of God. And on the basis of some Old Testament passages and some New Testament passages, he argues biblically, as he carefully always does, and strongly that all children will go into the presence of the arms of Jesus who loves and cares for them. And so for those of us in our midst who may be hurting, consider this truth and reality. Get the book. Read it. I'll give you some practical applications in just a minute. Very important to think about. In the Old Testament, there's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 where David, because of his um, uh, adultery with uh, Bathsheba, the result of that relationship, even though he was married, produced a child. The child got sick and, and died uh, for whatever reason. And uh, David mourns in sackcloth and ashes for a number of days. And then some people come to him and he's done mourning and so on. And they're like, why are you done mourning? Why aren't you mourning anymore? And I understand the grieving mourning process is different for everyone. And I don't doubt that even later in life, David reflected back on this at times. But the text says that David in the Old Testament said, he cannot come to me, but I shall go to him. Well, that must mean just dying and going into the grave. No, I think it means more. David had a belief and a trust that this child that died at birth was in the arms of our eternal, loving, and gracious God. There are other issues related to this topic. We had a long discussion in our small group this last week. What about a variety of different things? But I trust MacArthur on this one as in many other places. And there are other resources available. Billy Graham's comment just to as I mentioned a few minutes ago, safe in the arms of God. So as we close this morning, what can we do to make a difference? I've only got a couple minutes. I can mention these things quickly, but uh, for your consideration. Number one, we have a newly formed Sanctity of Life team, as I mentioned earlier, both in this message and for the team. My desire in instigating it is not to become highly political, but to be involved accordingly and appropriately so where God would have us to be involved. So get involved in some capacity. Number two, you'll see in your bulletins this insert for new life on the back side of sermon note page, a very trusted uh, local family service that's available. And we've done the baby bottles before. They're out in the lobby and you can pick one up and support financially new life family services in a creative way as you pray and think about their ministry over the coming weeks. More in the bulletin about that. Some of us, Tom in particular, uh, Greenlee and, and myself and others will go down to the march at the Capitol on Tuesday uh, to pray and to ponder and to reflect. There's a bus, you can sign up for that. Certainly pray. Pray about being involved. Pray about those who have no voice that we might uh, step in the gap and be available. Read the book that I just mentioned. Get in touch with a good biblical uh, counsel, with good biblical counsel and encouragement from a trusted Christian friend or counselor if you're struggling. Even now, after all these years, there is much grace that comes to us from the Lord and we trust and pray that we will communicate that to you as a church body as well. Speak up and be a voice for those who have no voice. Father, I pray that you'd encourage us, challenge us, get us to think and pro process these things this morning as we think about the value of human life because you value it. May we as well in the midst of a broken culture and world where it's not easy and it's 
It's difficult for ourselves personally, for those around us, family and friends, for our culture. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Communion Sunday, so there's a Care Fund offering at the door. See you tonight at the prayer meeting. Happy to visit or pray up front here. Go in the peace of the Lord.